We are live on Facebook for the Thursday edition of the Not Your Average Investor Show. I am your host, Pablo Gonzalez. My co-host is the guy they call GC because he is giving constantly and because his name is Greg Cohen. Say hello, Greg. Wow. Well, thank you, buddy. That's, that's what this show is about, right? We're trying to give constantly. We're trying to make sure that you guys leave here with a lot of value and you guys are in for a treat here for the Thursday Property of the Week show. So excited to be here with you all. You are in for a treat uh, because today we are going to go over a little property on 6189 Checkmate Lane. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's Pablo didn't get to name this property, by the way. You know, he's the ultimate hype guy out there. This was, uh, this is Checkmate, baby. So sign, seal, and deliver. This is a good one. We know it, right? Checkmate. If you've been, if you've been resisting buying a property, you're about to get checkmated. <laughs> 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 you know, street names mean so much out there, by the way, like you can raise or lower property values just by naming of streets. I was actually, you know, this was a few years back, but I was looking for, um, we were going to be moving at that time. And I went and I looked at a home that I really liked and my wife liked it. And then I looked at the address. It was on Chrysanthemum street. <laughs> can you imagine writing chrysanthemum or like saying somebody like saying your address over the phone chrysanthemum like that would add like i would be bald like 10 years earlier just because i lived on that street so yes we like checkmate i'd never i never thought about that that sounds like a great like economic study right like that feels like one of these things like the freakonomics guys would like study the the effect of a name on a street for property yeah. value Exactly. That's really interesting. Well, so for all, those of you that are with us often, we see a lot of our regulars. We see Marilyn Lee. We see uh, Muhammad. We see John Evans is here. We see Jake already with the, with the what up. Welcome back, everyone. You know the deal on Thursdays. We go over the property. We're all hanging out. This is a user-generated show more than anything, even more than Tuesdays is. Um, and we want everybody to contribute as much as possible. So the best way to do that is two ways. One is the chat when you want to talk amongst yourselves and you can even get to us, but there's a little problem in the chat and that the default, it only has you talking to us. So Sergio, what's up, Sergio? Good to see you. But you put in there, you, you got to change that blue button that's right above the text box and drop it from all panelists to all panelists and attendees so everybody can see it. And we want everybody interacting with each other. So that would be the perfect way to communicate in the chat. And then if you want to ask a question to myself, to Greg, you want me to ask Greg, or you just want to be heard on the show. The best way to do that is to hit that Q&A button that's on the bottom right of your screen. And there you go, Sergio. What's up? <laughs> and, and, uh, and put it in the Q&A box because there's just a lot going on, right? Like I got, I'm trying to monitor the chat for comments and be able to contribute. I have the Q&A box. We also have the Facebook Live. Welcome for those of you that are on Facebook watching us as well. Um, I got a lot going on. I'm trying to also listen to Greg so that when he tests me, I don't look stupid in front of everybody because I do that enough already. Um, so if you don't want me to go cross-eyed, put the questions in the Q&A box and uh, I promise we will try to get there. Miguel Angel Sanudo, good evening from Europe to you, my friend. Wow. Uh, where in Europe? Are you in Spain? Anyways, well, TBD. Also, if you like what you hear or you are waiting for a little bit more information, the best place to go after this show is go to jwbwebclass.com where Greg has put together a really great informational session that will tell you all the nuts and bolts of rental property investing that you need to know about the markets, uh, what to look for, how it compares to other asset classes, stuff like that. And you'll get to get for free, the free investor toolkit that JWB provides that includes the spreadsheet that I'm going to be tinkering with today on the show so that you can use it for all your analyses. I believe that's how you say that in plural. Well done. Yeah, right. I, I, I got analyses right and then I got plural kind of messed up. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> so Greg, are you ready to check mate this thing? Oh man, born ready, baby. Let's, born let's get ready. into it. All right, we're going to pop it onto the screen. And here we go. Can we see it? We can see it. We can see it. So Greg, oh, also I'm going to be over explaining some of the visuals here because if you don't know, we repurpose this into podcasts. So if you are listening to us on a podcast right now in the future, hello. And we are looking at a property. This looks like an existing property from what I'm seeing. It doesn't look like a new construction because it looks a little bit different than most. Um, there is a a brown yard and a, and a house with some like green trim on the windows, uh, purchase price of 165,000. 
It has a estimated conventional financing ROI of 10.39% and a total monthly cash flow of $252. Now, Greg, that is the cash flow that people get in their pocket after expenses. Can you explain that number a little bit and maybe explain the 10, 10% as well? Absolutely. Yes. You should be looking when you're thinking about analyzing a rental property to purchase for investment purposes, you should be looking at return on investment and cash flow in your pocket on a monthly basis. So, you know, in JWB and Jacksonville, we're going to be able to perform between nine to 11% return. So one of the reasons I chose this property as, as the one that I would recommend for you is because the returns are really high. That's the first place to look. And people ask, why is that the first place to look? Well, obviously we're here to, to earn a return for you. That's why you're putting your dollars to work. But the reason why I want you to look there first rather than just purchase price or just rent amount or just property taxes is because that return on investment is the great equalizer. It takes all of those inputs in and determines what is the best use of the capital. And that's where you want to be between nine to 11% based on current market conditions. So we're at a little bit under 10 and a half percent. That's a big win. Now the monthly cash flow number, that 252, what that is talking to you about is the amount of positive cash flow that you're going to receive in your bank account on a normal month. All right. So a normal month means that it's rented and that you're paying a mortgage payment and that you're paying property management fees. And the, the net amount of those two things or of those multiple things is going to be 250 or so dollars on this investment property, which is pretty normal forward market conditions at the moment. 250 is a great amount. If you've been a part of our uh, Not Your Average Investor shows, especially on Thursdays over the last few weeks and whatnot, you've seen many renovated homes somewhere around 250. Uh, now I'll tell you, we've gotten to 300 on a couple, but what do you notice different about those, Pablo? Let's see if I can throw you off right off the bat here. What do you notice different about those properties that actually got a little bit higher than 250? You are... Definitely throwing me off here for a loop. What am I noticing differently? I'm, I'm trying to, would they be new construction? Is that, is that what it has to do with a, higher, with a higher price point of the actual home and therefore a bigger investment that you have to put down? Checkmate. <laughs> <laughs> yes, buddy. You're right. The higher purchase price. Not, it doesn't have to be the, the new construction or non-new construction. It's a higher purchase price, right? If you're going to see a higher purchase price, you better see a higher monthly cash flow. And that's why I go back to that return on investment as being the great equalizer, because that's what takes all that into account. <laughs> so we're going to see how many times we get checkmates. Somebody needs to do a counter here, because I think there's going to be a lot of that use of that word today. I think we need to clarify checkmate first, because when you first said checkmate, I thought I was wrong. But then you said checkmate and I was right. So can we have, a, can we have some rules for checkmating here, well, Greg? It's we... like you are the person who is getting checkmate to the other person always, right? It's, you, I don't know. I don't play chess. I mean, when you, when you get chess checkers, what, what do you do? Do you say checkmate when you do it or what? <laughs> bingo. <laughs> bingo. <laughs> we'll try to get a property on bingo lane next time. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Bingo Lane or Yahtzee Lane, who knows? Yeah, All, right. And, <laughs> All right, I'm going to checkmate this conversation and move forward here. Um, so, Greg, what I see here, but by the way, great comments in the chat right now. A couple of y'all has to have still are only commenting to us at all panelists, right? So if you want to, if you want to contribute to everybody, hit that blue button and go to all panelists and attendees because I, I think we're gonna, I think we're gonna laugh today. I don't know. Um, so, Greg, so so you said something about you said something about this price, right? This price of one sixty five thousand. Uh, to me, when I first saw it, I was like, okay, this is, uh, this is lower than the usual new construction property that we put up there. Uh, but it's also higher than last week. Like last week's we had one that was like 120,000, right? So is this, is this an average price? Is this a high price, a low price? Can you kind of tell me how it looks? Yeah, absolutely. So overall, regardless if it's new construction or renovations, your typical purchase prices are going to be between about 150,000 upwards to about 210,000. So that's your range. And we're largely gonna be there every single time. Uh, I think the property we were looking at last week, I think it was on the lower end, but I think it was still cl somewhere close around 150, if I'm not mistaken there. Um, and that's just because we're in the same neighborhoods over and over and over again. Many of you have seen the map 
Uh, we may pull the map up later here, but the map of Jacksonville defines kind of where our neighborhoods are that we invest and that we put our own money and put all of our clients and they don't change. And so in those neighborhoods, largely you see the same market values and ultimately that's how we get consistency for you. It's how we perform. And that's why your purchase prices are there. Now, out of that 150 to 210 scale, generally what you're going to see is new construction generally are bigger homes and they're new construction homes. And so the market value of a new construction home generally is higher. So your purchase prices for new construction will be higher generally. New, uh, for renovations, generally a little bit lower. If I was to ballpark it, generally your purchase prices for renovations are somewhere maybe 150 to maybe 180,000. And for your new construction, maybe you know, 180 to 210,000 is more likely. Um, so overall, this is a lower purchase price. Uh, if you're going 150 to 210, this is on the lower side. If you're just talking about renovations, this is pretty typical. This is sort of smack dab in the middle there for a renovated home. Great. And then the last thing that I want to go over for anybody that's been around, you kind of know this, um, for anybody that's new, I think it's important to talk about, I can't help but notice this 0% appreciation rate here. And I would imagine that somebody else that's newly look at, looking at this, uh, at these numbers, they have a question for that. Are you not anticipating this house to appreciate? Can you explain through why we do that? Absolutely. So we put 0% there, but that does not mean we don't expect this home to appreciate. You know, the reality is that the reason why people come to Jacksonville to invest is because they want to be in a market where you can get positive cash flow, just like you see here, but you also have a higher potential and a higher track record of historical home price appreciation. And historical home price appreciation is a great leading indicator for future home price appreciation if you're buying and holding for a full market cycle. So all that being said, we expect this to perform for the investor out there. If you're an investor who's planning on holding for a full market cycle, which is known to be at least between 10 to 20 years, then you can expect significant home price appreciation. And the Jacksonville market has actually appreciated much more than other comparable cash flow markets out there. I did the numbers on it, I did the data on it. Jacksonville's actually uh, appreciated 34% more than comparable cash flow markets out there like Memphis, Birmingham, Dallas, Kansas City, and Cleveland. If you take the average appreciation rates there and you compare it to Jacksonville, 34% more appreciation in Jacksonville. So that's why people come to Jacksonville. Even if we get lower cash on cash returns, lower returns from the rents slightly, they come here because we're still cash flow positive. It's still a great return there. And then you're going to appreciate more if you hold on for a full market cycle. So, Greg, I put a number in here, uh, but what is, I, I want you to say this for the, for the podcast, like right is, what is the average appreciation rate in Jacksonville? Yes. If you go back from uh, 1991 all the way through present day and you took the uh, average appreciation rate year over year, it'd be 4.3% in Jacksonville. Well, Zach Correa just checkmated you because he put that Jacksonville Heights has risen 6.2% over the last 12 months. There you go. I was there just saying that up the whole time. So oh, also Mike Parsons put in the, in, in the private chat to us in this market, don't rely on appreciation as part of your review. For me, it's a bonus if there's any appreciation, right? Which is kind of your philosophy and why you offer it this way. That's right. So when we put 0% for the appreciation on the evaluations, you know, if you go to JWB web class and you um, request the investor toolkit, you're going to see here that there's 0% right off the bat. The reason is because of what Mike talked about. I don't know how long you're going to hold the property. You know, you may listen to me and hold on for at least 10 years and hopefully longer, uh, but you may not. And I'm very, very much of the opinion that home price appreciation in the short run is speculative. So if you're an investor who's buying and holding and planning on selling in one, two, three years, even five years, you shouldn't be counting on home price appreciation. You should be saying and doing what, just what Mike said. Now, if you are an investor who's planning on holding on for a full market cycle, you can and you should be looking at long-term historical home price appreciation rates. Because if you don't, history proves that that is most likely to happen and you're, you may be making the wrong decision for the type of market to be investing in if you don't look at historical home price appreciation if you're in for the long haul. There's already so much checkmate talk. Um, so I just, I just want to say, you know, it, 
as you know, Zach puts in that it's in Jacksonville Heights, it's written 6.2%. Miguel Angel is, is saying that um, predictions of home values in Jacksonville Heights will increase 9.1% over the next year. But why do you use 4.3%, uh, Greg? I'm sure all that data is accurate, but you know, home price appreciation, in my opinion, the conversation can quickly become a slippery slope. We can quickly become infatuated with the data. And if I was to show you what the real home price appreciation was over the last year or the last couple of years in Jacksonville, it would be much more than 4%. But I don't want you thinking that way. I don't want you thinking short term, micro time period, and even micro neighborhood uh, when it comes to home price appreciation. I want you to think macro. I want you to think long term. That's the only way I think about home price appreciation. You know, I've been holding my properties for 15 years. I've been there. I've seen in the up, down, the up market, the down market. And I know that over time, they perform at about a 4% clip for home price appreciation average year over year. Uh, and that's the way you should be thinking about it. Um, in the short run, you run the risk of getting too infatuated with home price appreciation. And, you know, Pablo, you had put 4.3% in that evaluation. Here's why I think it can quickly become a slippery slope. You know, when you're buying with conventional financing, one of the best values of buying with conventional financing is that as markets go up over time, your returns go way up because you're using the bank's money and you only put a small percentage as a down payment, right? So if you're going to use what the appreciation and rate has been for the last year or two years or what it's been in a specific neighborhood, which is all micro stuff, uh, and you put 6% there, instead of 4.3%, your returns skyrocket. They go even way higher. And, you know, Mike brings up a good point in the chat. I've been kind of seeing it as well. And he says, you know, cash flow is king. And I think we need to go back to the number one rule of investing, which is positive cash flow. Once you get to positive cash flow, then you can start to look at some of these other profit centers. But if you just look at the profit centers over the long haul and know and look at the data that historically has performed real data and look at market segment, like look at market cycles, right? 10 to 20 year cycles show that the return, that, that uh, market cycles return to the norm when it comes to home price appreciation. So anything other than that is somewhat speculative and that's why I don't really use it. Great, so let's explain a little bit, first of all, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna get to questions in a second. I wanna I wanna get through a little bit more a little a little more like basic stuff. And Greg, when I put 4.3 percent appreciation rate here, the total return on investment on conventional financing goes from 10.4 percent to to 26.02 percent. Right, it takes this astronomical jump, while the non recourse financing doesn't increase quite as much, and the uh, cash financing increases slightly as well. Uh, can you explain that for anybody that's new here? And then we'll get into some more user generated questions. Absolutely. So what we're showing here is in an appreciating market, the value of using conventional financing is incredibly high. Um, and it's much higher your returns on investment for buying a property with conventional financing in an appreciating market will be much higher relative to what they would be if you bought that same property with cash. And it all comes down to what you put down, right? Your down payment. So in this property where we're putting down 25% um, for conventional financing, you're only putting a quarter of the money down. So in a, in a very simple uh, example here, let's say that the property value that you purchased was $100,000. And the value of that property went up $4,000 in a year. That's a 4% appreciation on that property. Well, if you bought that with conventional financing and you only put 25% down, if you look at 4%, that $4,000 gain over what you put down, which is $25,000, that's actually a 16% return on the investment just from home price appreciation, all right? So that's what you're seeing on the screen here is Pablo puts in 4% and the returns jump up from about 10.5% to about 26%. That's exactly what's going on there. And when you're investing in a market that is shown to appreciate over the long haul, conventional financing 
is, a, is an incredible tool for you to maximize your returns. Um, conversely, if you're using it with cash, a cash purchase, you bought that same property for $100,000, you paid all cash for it, it went up $4,000. That $4,000 gain is now over $100,000 total investment. So that's only a 4% return from the appreciation. And so there is why so many investors are using conventional financing now. Well, I'll say that's why so many people have been using conventional financing for a long time with uh, investing in rental properties this is why I do it. But even now your rates are only 4% when it comes to the interest rate and it's creating a significant amount of additional demand and people are, are really using financing uh, to their advantage now. Great explanation. Now, Carlos de Oliveira has a question in the chat that asks, what is the expected rent growth? And I see here estimated rent range, uh, 1199 to 1249, right? So is that what it's expected to grow? And how sh should he be looking at that expected rent? How does that compare to the appreciation piece or the other profit centers? It's a great question. We haven't gotten into this too much, but in terms of rent growth, we're really conservative. If you look at estimates out there, it's actually much higher than the number that we use. Jacksonville is one of the markets that has shown that for single family homes, the rent growth has been a lot higher than even um, other places in the country. Um, but we use 1% as our expected rent growth. Not what we've historically performed, but we're just conservative again similar to how we look at the home price appreciation conversation. We want to be conservative. We want people buying in for the numbers that uh, we have here and now, um, and then look at any additional rent growth as uh, kind of a cherry on top. Um, so we're at 1% for our evaluations and that's baked into other tabs that you just, you aren't seeing here. It's, it's in the details. Um, but, uh, but 1% is what we use. Great. Now I'm going to get into the questions in the Q and A, but real quick, there was one in the chat here from Sergio that I think is a one word answer. Assuming I hold onto a piece of property for a full market cycle and I then decide to sell the property, does JWB assist in selling that property for me to another investor? Or is it something that I, as the owner of the property, I'm solely responsible for? I think you can answer that pretty quickly. Oh, it's going to be tough in one word, man. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, Sergio, we, uh, we assist with the sale. We're going to facilitate the sale for you. So when the time is right for you to liquidate, you're going to come to JWB. We're going to work with you up until then to help you decide when the right time to sell is. And, uh, and when that time comes, you're going to sell. Now you're not going to sell. Well, you can sell to whoever you want, but we're going to try to help you sell to an owner occupant because owner occupants pay the most for properties. If you sell to another investor, they're going to buy it as a discount. And our job is to try to produce the best return on investment for you. So uh, we're going to facilitate that for you. Most likely, hopefully it's to an owner occupant to give you the best return on investment. So basically you're going to help them sell at retail, right? Help you, help you sell at retail. And we don't sell at retail for you because we work with you all. We work with investors, right? We don't sell homes to owner occupants. Um, so we're going to connect you with a real estate agent that we have a lot of trust in who has sold homes for us in the past. And, uh, and we'll, we'll facilitate that for you. Greg, you know what happened when you didn't answer with a one word answer? What? You got checkmated. All right. Oh. So now we're, so, so now we are on to, I described the property a little bit before, right? But this does look, this looks like an older property. Lee Bishop in the Q and A says house is 42 years old. Looks like it will need a new roof, but maintenance still shows 6% average. Should that maintenance number be a little higher? You want to talk about the maintenance number here that we show here at 6%? Yes, absolutely. Let's talk about why that 6% first, and then we'll talk a little bit about what we see in the, as far as that picture here in, uh, in a second here. So these numbers, and I'm so glad our, our investors, our audience here is so knowledgeable, right? They look to things like maintenance costs. They look to things that, of, of that percentage, and they're saying, well, is, should it really be that way? Well, a little kind of a dirty secret in this industry is that most turnkey companies, when they represent um, properties to sell, they have no historical performance as to what their maintenance costs have actually been. And the way that you impact maintenance cost is a combination of how well did you renovate that home and then how well have you managed it, right? How long have you kept the resident in place and managed that home? And so if you're investing from a company where you buy the property from one person and then you go out and you find your own property manager, you're never going to get this sort of cohesive data to be able to measure this. JWB, we have in-house property management and we have all of this data. And then we've actually tracked it. 
So most people, when they renovate, or excuse me, when they buy a turnkey investment property, they just don't know. So they use industry standards. They use, you know, 5% as a cost for your vacancy and 7% as a percentage of your rents uh, for the cost for expected maintenance. But Pablo, you know where that number comes from? I don't. I think I just got checkmated. You got checkmated, man. Nobody knows, right? Nobody has the data to back it up. If you're buying a property and somebody tells you it's going to be 5 and 7%, ask them to show you their real performance at performing at 5% and 7%. They just can't do it. Um, we can. We started to track every dollar in and every dollar out. We've done it since 2011. There's over 2,000 turnkey properties that have been sold to our clients that we manage for them, and we have all the data. And so that's where that 3% vacancy cost comes from and that 6% maintenance cost comes from. That's a percentage of the rents. And if you look at our entire portfolio for renovated homes, um, that's what you're going to see that we perform for. So that's what yours is most likely going to come to over the long haul. Great. So let's talk about this property and how it looks, Greg. Is this, is this currently what this house looks like right now? No. So we, this is a, a pre-renovation picture. So I thought that's where Lee was going by looking at the roof. And you know, this isn't the prettiest looking picture out there, right? Uh, a lot of the times, the ones that uh, we've recommended in the past, I've looked to the ones that had, you know, that have been already sort of had the, the post-marketing pictures done. But that's not always real, right? So the lifeline, the, the life cycle of the property is that we start to market this home for sale probably about maybe a week or so before the renovation is 100% buttoned up and we're ready to, of course, have potential residents going through there. Um, so this picture is actually pre-renovation. If I was to take a picture, which I don't have at the moment because we get our pictures, of course, after the house is completely punched out, um, the, the house would look a lot better than what you see here. But I think this is great to look at this picture because honestly, the picture is the least important part of the decision when you're making a decision to invest in a rental property, right? You should be buying it based on the numbers. Um, so this one, uh, currently right now, it's in the punch out stage, I believe. So it's kind of that stage after all of the work has been done, it looks great on the outside. And then there's some little tic-tac things that we gotta fix on the inside, which we're doing. And then we'll officially open it up to be uh, marketed and um, to fill with the new residents. They start coming through, you know, I would imagine sometime in the next week um, is kind of the, the timeline on this property. Great. So then that tells me that this property doesn't have anybody living in it yet, right? Obviously you just implicitly said that, um, but you offer, you're offering this property right now. And I know that you offer properties that are cash flow positive on day one. So what, what am I missing here? What's the gap there? Yeah, that's great. And I'm glad that we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about this. All right. So if you have listened to me in the past, I talk about how important it is to be cash flow positive from day one. It's something I believe is a huge advantage to working with a company like JWB. Um, it's a huge advantage for working with other turnkey providers who are reputable um, because generally they can get you to cash flow positive sooner than if you're doing it by yourself. Because if you're doing it by yourself, you got to go through probably six to 12 months of working with partners and buying the house and renovating it and all that other stuff. So anyways, cash flow positive from day one is a basic tenant of what I believe is successful rental property investing. For this home, I just shared with you and the picture shows that the renovation isn't 100% done at this moment. Um, but we're going to sell it prior to the house uh, being buttoned up. Now, how does that all work? Well, what happens is when you buy a rental property from JWB, and from most turnkey providers, there's not actually going to be a resident who has signed the lease at the time that you put it under contract, right? We're gonna sell it to you. You gotta be comfortable looking at it and say, okay, yeah, JWB can handle getting this home rented. And then JWB is gonna to continue to market this home for about the next 30 to maybe 45 days, which is how long it takes for you to actually close on the home. So the home is not actually rented at the time of putting it under contract. It is rented at the time of close. And so you're not going to see vacancy costs. You're going to be cash flow positive from the time of closes, which is ultimately all that matters. But there is a little bit of nuance there that I thought would be a great thing to kind of clear up for some newer investors. Let's, let's get a little bit clearer on that timeline real quick, Greg. So 
when I hear you talking about this, I think of a couple different timelines and, and Svetlana uh, asked this in the, in, in the chat as well. I hear of a couple different timelines. I think of from the time you purchase a property to renovate, rent, you know, renovate, sell, rent, and, and close. Mm -hmm. And then I would imagine that there's also the question of if you're also an investor and you own the property, how quickly you turn over a property. So can you talk about the different time periods of, of the first one versus the second one? Yes. So, and for the first, well, let me take the one that I remember the most <laughs> of what you just said. Now we're talking, we've kind of switched to if you're already an owner and then your resident leaves, how quickly do we fill that, that vacancy is what you're asking there? Yeah. Okay. Just so how quickly about, do you turn a property when somebody's an investor already? Uh, probably 10 to maybe 14 days. Okay. Um, well, so let me actually walk you through that timeline. 10 to 14 days until we start to market the home. And overall, it's about 40 days of, uh, from the total time until when a new resident moves in. Okay. So, you know, we take the property back 10 days or so. It's ready to market again. Call it another 30 days from what we call market to move in. And then total, you're in uh, at about 40 days historically is where we are for a total time of, call it vacancy. Um, and, and so there's, there's that one. Now, the first one, did you want me to go through the timeline from the client's perspective of how long um, we would be renovating the home? I would say from your perspective, if we could illustrate, right? So like, I think we confused Marilyn a little bit. She puts, I thought all homes were rented before sold. I guess I've misunderstood. Just go through that timeline of you find a property, uh, I guess in renovation, I guess is when this is really most applicable, right? But you find a property, you're going to go through a renovation period. At some point, you also sell it. And then as it's being closed, you are going to bring in a tenant. And by the time you turn it over, that's going to be cash flow positive day one. So maybe just explain the windows of time there that are, yeah, that let's, are included. Let's take it from the client's perspective, right? You need to be earning positive cash flow once you've put your money on the table somewhere, right? That is the closing. That is all that matters. If JWB rented it before we went to closing, you weren't going to see that money anyways, because JWB owned that property ahead of time, right? So the thing that matters, and for Marilyn's question, I'm glad she brought it up. The thing that matters for any investor out there is that when your money's in the deal, when you go to the closing table and you actually own it, it needs to be performing for you. And so that's how we structure everything that we do, right? You know, there's a whole lot of work a whole, that goes into the acquisition and the clearing of the title and then either the renovation or the bill that you guys will never ever see because you don't care, right? By the time that we get it ready to sell and then quickly start to rent out, we just need to make sure that we can do that and still show up at the closing table with it being cash flow positive for you. And so that's really all that matters and that's what we do. Do you provide any kind of guarantee that that's the condition? Is that, is that, is that kind of how you sell this thing? Yeah. Ah, oh, rent guarantee. So we do not guarantee it. We do not guarantee it. Part of that is I want everybody to understand first and foremost, that when you're investing in any investment and with rental properties, there are risks to this. And the greatest risk to you is going to be maintenance cost and vacancy cost. It's how a really wonderful investment turns sour for many people out there who either go at it alone or don't do their due diligence on the right turnkey company to work with, right? It's maintenance and vacancy cost. And so when I bring you on, when my team brings you on, I want you to walk in and know that maintenance costs and vacancy costs are a risk. Now you'll hear a lot of other companies out there that offer rent guarantees. JWB doesn't offer a rent guarantee, right? Everything I'm talking to you about as far as being cash flow positive, as far as not walking in with uh, vacancy costs right off the bat, that's me being confident and telling you that we can deliver for you over doing this for over 2000 properties for you know, 15 years now. I'm confident you can hold my team to that and, and me to that, but I'm not going to guarantee it because you got to be prepared. There's maintenance costs, there's vacancy costs. That's a risk. That's a part of it. Now, here's what a lot of other companies do. In the general landscape of turnkey, car, uh, mark, uh, turnkey companies, you know, we've been doing this for 15 years. There's really only like one other company that I know that has been doing it that long. Everybody else sort of popped up like two years ago when it became very much in vogue to be a turnkey rental property company. 
And the challenge and the harm in that is that they've only been around for two years. Many times they have a staff that you could probably count on two hands, right? I know that it takes a staff of, I mean, we have a staff of 80. We don't just employ people because we like employing people, <laughs> right? It takes a large staff. And I'll tell you, when we were two years into our business, we weren't very good. <laughs> you know, we're a lot better now. We, we learned a lot about what it really takes to create a passive investment for folks. And there's a lot of other turnkey companies out there that are struggling uh, to perform. And so what they do is they offer a rent guarantee. Uh, it is somewhat of a gimmick. And I, what I want to point out to other folks out there is that the rent guarantee should not be the reason you decide to go with a company. You should do your due diligence and think about the long term. Is that company going to be able to perform for you? Because what you should realize is for a company, if they have any sort of large client base, if they've been around for a while, they're not going to offer a rent guarantee. And the reason is because if they took on a large client base and they offered this rent guarantee, they could potentially lose thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. They couldn't afford it. They couldn't afford to do it, right? And the other thing is that if they know this, then what they're going to do with this rent guarantee is they're going to put the first tenant in there for you, right? They're going to put somebody in with a short-term lease, a one-year lease. And we know that it takes long-term tenant stays, long-term resident stays. You want them to be a resident, right? In order to accomplish this, they need to stay three years, four years or more right? So if you go with somebody just because they offer a rent guarantee, you're probably going with a smaller outfit who doesn't have as much experience. And you're probably going to settle for a one-year lease, which in the long run hurts you. Because if you have a one-year lease, you have tenants that turn over every year. And that maintenance and that vacancy cost will kill you. It'll be a lot more than 3% and 6% that we've been able to show on renovated homes. That makes a lot of sense. So the misalignment of the misalignment of incentives is created by trying to uphold a guarantee that you can't keep up with, right? But that's, that's different than the guarantees you get on the renovation or the construction or any of that stuff, right? This is just talking about cash flow guarantees, right? Yeah, this is talking about a rent guarantee. Everybody who's buying a property with JWB, you have no risk when it comes to the maintenance, excuse me, the renovation cost or the new construction build cost. That's JWB's risk. That's one of the reasons you invest with a turnkey partner, they should be taking that on. We do. So there's no risk to you there. Um, this would be specifically talking about rent guarantees um, there. Perfect. So now we're going to crank through some of these Q&A questions. Thank you, everybody, for putting them in the Q&A. Now, now you see why like there's, I've been going back and forth with the chat because it's topical and I don't want to miss it. Um, but these ones are in the Q&A. They stay here so I can kind of crank through them at the end and, and, and it really helps me out. So I really appreciate everybody complying with that. So Margaret Smith asks, okay, with this very high estimated annual appreciation for next year, is that due to what I might call the JWB effect? If you take a 70K home and sell it for 165K, what does that do to Zillow estimates for the rest of that neighborhood? Doesn't it get an immediate and forced lift? A lot to unpack there. Let's start with the first one, which is if we... I think it was something along the lines of, should we count on home price appreciation for the first, for the first year? I think this is an understood. I think they're taking the assumption that there is going to be home price appreciation. Okay. Yeah. The first thing I would caution is I don't, I would not use 4.3% if you're thinking year over year, only use this if you're thinking full market cycle, which is between 10 to 20 years for your hold. So that's the only time you put 4.3% in that uh, evaluation. Um, and then the next question is, I think about the JWB, the JWB effect, right? We're in the same neighborhoods over and over again. Is there forced appreciation because of what JWB is doing? Well, you got to realize that we're in Jacksonville. Jacksonville is the largest city by land mass in the country. Um, we are three quarters the size of the state of Rhode Island. So while I show you the neighborhoods that we are invested in, there is a, a whole lot of properties that we do not have any impact on. You know, I was just looking at the number of houses on the market, right? There's around six to seven, maybe 8,000 homes on the market at any time here in Jacksonville. And uh, we sell about 450 properties a year. So we, while we are in our neighborhoods and we do the same thing over and over again, this is not us being able to control the market. 
So when you look at that market value, that $165,000 market value, that's coming from other houses as well who have, which have sold in that area. That's how you determine market value. That's how an appraiser would do it. So while we're there and we know that we're there for a reason, um, it's not like we can set the market. Correct. Now, I think the rest of the question is just essentially saying if somebody sells at 165K after a home was bought for 70K, it brings up the value of the rest of the neighborhood, right? Yeah. Yeah. Anytime you have a home selling at full market value, I mean, that um, would either, that typically brings up the value for the next one that sells, right? I mean, that's how markets appreciate in neighborhoods, things that sell for full market value. And then the next one will sell for a little bit higher and a little bit higher. So yeah, if we took a home that we bought well below 165,000, we put all of this work into it and then we then sell it for market value. It certainly helps the whole market value for the entire area. Excellent. Next question. Cecile Jamey asks, good morning, Pablo and Greg. I have a question when it comes to asset privacy and protection. How would you take title when you start accumulating many properties? I have mine recorded in my living trust, but my name is in the public eye for everyone to see. I tried a land trust, but when it came to refinancing, it became very challenging. LLC can be expensive and privacy trust, question mark, question mark, question mark. What are your thoughts about privacy and protection? You sound very, very knowledgeable about this. You've been down a lot of roads that I have been down as well. And you've come to similar conclusions that I've come to as well. Um, I don't know if I have a great, great answer for you. I'd say, you know, there's give and takes to every, everything that you threw out there. I'll tell you what my journey has been. Um, in the beginning, when I started to invest in 2006, my business partners and I bought about 40 rental properties over the first year and a half. And uh, those rental properties um, at point, well, the most important thing was for me was acquiring the assets and growth. And so using conventional financing was the tool to do that. You, it's super hard or you really can't use conventional financing like you will when it's owned in your personal name. Um, if you're trying to do it in an LLC or a trust or a land trust or a privacy trust, it just doesn't work. So we needed to keep it in our personal names to do that. Um, then after the fact that we, we purchased them with conventional financing, you can do some of these strategies to get it into the LLC or the, the different trusts. You can do that. And we did that. Now I'll tell you though, that you have to work with a team of professionals to do it the right way. So I would first encourage you to reach out to your lawyer, CPA or JWB to help you kind of with that process, but it's not easy. So like once your home gets into the trust, things like insurance companies don't really understand how that works. Right. Um, LLCs can be expensive. So depending on what you want to do, if you want to put it in an LLC, you know, it's, it's, it's expensive. You have to keep the books and, you know, we had 40 rental properties. So I wasn't going to do that for every LLC, you know, every property, right? Some people say you can put three properties in an LLC or five or 10. It's different for every person. What I did is I just kept in my personal name and I, I gave up the anonymity to gain the ability to get the financing the ease of use and the cost. And then I just got a lot of insurance. And that is what worked for me. That's not going to work for everybody. Um, and now it's changed now. I mean, I'm 15 years in and we have over 300 rental properties and now they're analyses, right? And so it, it has, you know, and my life has changed, right? I've got beautiful wife and two beautiful kids and I think differently now. So the, the truth is somewhere in between for you. Um, but uh, I've used everything you said there, land trust, LLCs, personal name, Honestly, I don't really understand privacy trust, how that all falls into line. I'm not your expert there. Um, but, but all have different values, right? Land trusts give you anonymity. LLCs give you complete protection. Personal name, you give up some of that stuff, um, but you get, it's, uh, you get the most uh, tax, I mean, you get the most benefits from it and it's ease of use. And this is the point of the call when I like to bring up our Facebook group. Right, We have a Facebook group that has over 1,700 investors, and it also has past guests of the show. For example, last week, we had Al Nicoletti on the show that was talking all about asset protection. So I highly encourage you go check out that episode either on YouTube or when it comes out on the podcast or join our Facebook group and you can ask him yourself. And to join there, you go to jwbfacebookgroup.com. I just put it in the chat a second ago. I'll do it again right after I ask this question. Peter asks, will it be, oh yeah, so he's talking about the property now. 
He asks, will it be rent ready? Windows blinds, ceiling fan, landscaping, thank you. Oh, of course. Everybody should think about the assets that we put in front of you as being served up on a silver platter for you when it comes to you closing on the home, right? When it goes under contract, that's still a part of creating the silver platter, right? The home is probably done at this moment on the outside. There's probably a few ticky tacky things that we're fixing and then we're gonna get it ready to, to lease out for you. Um, so at this moment, it's not 100% buttoned up, but all that matters to you is that come closing time, you're gonna be cash flow positive. It's gonna be performing just like we put on that property evaluation and it's gonna be served up on a silver platter for you. It's gonna be a complete investment for you at that time. And that's what we commit to you. By the time you get the house, it's time for checkmate. <laughs> Goodness. Is that four or five? Where's our checkmate counter? I've lost. I've lost count here. I've lost count. I don't even know if it's funny anymore, right? Because nobody's laughing about it. So maybe I'll just stop. So, <laughs> I'll, give you a, I'll give you a courtesy laugh. Yeah. Well, you know, self-deprecation always works, right? So, so um, yeah, true turnkey, right? Kind of, uh, it's, it's everything that JWB does, right? It's, it's you're never going to have to do anything yourself is the way that I, that I understand it. Mm -hmm. So, all right. Zach Correa asks, the actual ROI for any investment opportunity is based on many factors and cannot be predicted with certainty. Does JWB's estimated ROI include or account for additional potential costs such as home warranties, closing costs, or additional maintenance or vacancies? So we do account for closing costs, which is a really important thing that most other turnkey providers do not put on their evaluations. If we just wanted to juice returns and make them higher than, you know, nine to 11%, an easy thing would be to be like everybody else and to not include those and probably bump your returns like a point or somewhere around there. Um, so we do include those. Um, home warranties, no, we don't do that. So, I mean, we don't, we don't go out of our way to recommend them. Um, I don't have them on my homes. Um, and the thought there is that, you know, you just got a home that either had, call it an average of $40,000 on a renovation or it's a brand new home. I mean, if you look at when home warranties really start to make sense, it's way down the line after your systems are way old. You know, that's, that's, that's kind of when it makes a lot of sense. Otherwise, it's not the best return on your investment just after you put a major renovation um, in your home. So um, we don't believe that's a great thing for a client to do right off the bat. So no, we don't include that. Um, you know, additional vacancies and maintenance costs, you know, we're all about the long run. And when we have data to support that you're going to be at three and 6% over the long haul, that's where we believe you're going to be. Um, that doesn't mean that every single year you're going to see 3% and 6%. You know, what's largely going to happen. And I think this would be a great kind of uh, show for us to do in the future, Pablo. It's kind of like the, the timing of your investment and how it really feels from a cash flow perspective, because it's not a straight line. What happens is when your home is rented, we're overperforming because you see much less maintenance cost than that 6% figure. You don't see any vacancy costs because you've got a resident there. And we're overperforming for you. Call it that three year span, maybe a four year span, right? Our average resident actually stays 54 months. So four and a half year span, we're overperforming. And then when they leave, then that year is not going to be the best year for you because you're going to have a few thousand dollars to put back into the property in terms of uh, small renovations to do and then vacancy costs. You have to continue to make the mortgage payment while they're not there. So you're kind of like on a one property level, you're kind of going like this, overperforming for four and a half years, boom. And you take a bit and then you go up again for four and a half years and then you come down, right? And that's really how it feels. We'll, we'll do a little bit more than, than just this nifty little thing here in a, in a future episode. Um, but to answer your question, Zach, over, overall, we expect you to be at, at that three and 6% because that's what history tells us. Sounds good, Greg. I, you know, I, as someone that gets to be a part of all of these shows, I just kind of want to point out the correlation here of everything that you're saying in the fact that it seems like JWB just kind of handles things ahead of time based on experience, right? Be it the warranty piece, you don't really recommend the warranty right away because what you're doing is making sure that you're handing over an asset that has been really, really well built, whether it's new construction or renovated to a high extent. You don't do the uh, cash flow guarantee because you put a lot of time and effort into making sure that you are bringing in the right uh, tenant, that you are shortening that time of vacancy before you actually rent it out. You, you, you make sure that you have it all handled ahead of time. And the same thing with the, with the vacancy, right? Like you have these 
methods in your property management systems where you are choosing tenants that are going to stay much longer term. You build these long-term relationships with them proactively so that they average five, six years in a home and they're actual residents, not just tenants. So I just wanted to point that out to everybody because I've had the benefit of kind of seeing this whole thing for the last almost a year now we're coming up on. It's been a long time, man. Appreciate it. You've been more connected to this business than any other partner than we've had who's not, you know, officially employed by JWB. So it's, it's, uh, it's awesome to hear. And those are the things that Pablo just pointed out there that when you're doing your due diligence and you're interviewing a property management company or a turnkey investment company, those are the things that matter. Not things like a rent guarantee, right? Not even year one returns, right? Because you should be holding on to this for the long haul, right? Everybody can juice their returns on this spreadsheet that we put out there, right? This is, this is the spreadsheet for the property we just talked about. If I wanted to show max returns and get that to be a 13% return on investment, just to pique your interest, I could do it so easily. I could take out closing costs, right? I could put in some other factor for maintenance and vacancy cost or whatever I wanted to do. Um, that's how a lot of turnkey companies operate because investors are, are you know, they're, they're, interest, they're, they're return sensitive, but you got to look beyond the return, right? You got to look at the functions that, that drive that return and ask yourself, can that teammate perform those functions for the long haul for a 10 year period. And when you feel confident that you're working with a partner that, that can, that's when you make the decision to invest uh, with that turnkey company, in my opinion. All right. Great answer, man. Uh, so I think I just checkmated all the other, uh, all the other marketing partners. <laughs> <laughs> you, did. you did a long time ago, buddy. Yeah, yeah. Full disclosure. I'm a, you know, I, I don't work full time for JWB, right? I'm a, I'm a marketing partner and I, and I manage this like content strategy to make it valuable. So I'm, and I'm a past client, right? And a future client. So I'm just like everybody else here. I'm learning along with everyone else. So speaking of other people that are learning along, Mohammed Udin has asked this and patiently waited for this. Mohammed, this is for you, buddy. Is there subject to buying options that JWB companies offer to their investors? Just curious. It's a great question, Mohammed. Uh, short answer is no. Um, for those who aren't familiar with subject to investing, it's a, an active strategy generally where you can basically, for lack of a better term, assume a current mortgage on a property and it allows you to lower your requirement of the capital that you need to get into a property. So it's, it's, a, it's one of those no money down strategies or a low money down strategy. Um, and that's not possible with JWB properties. Um, you're going to think about it as being very vanilla, right? You got to have at least 20% down or 25% down. And uh, now there's a whole lot of strategies that Pablo and I talk about and our clients talk about. And in the group, we talk about it as far as helping you raise that money or save that money or use that money wisely or use your retirement accounts. There's a lot of ways to do that. But at the end of the day, that money's going to have to come from somewhere um, and subject to wouldn't work. All right. Well, I'm glad to explain that because I had no idea what subject to was. Jackie Hung asks, what is the average closing cost in your stats? Two and a half percent of the purchase price is what we use. That's what we've seen historically. Boom. Quick answer, checkmate. <laughs> Miguel Angel Sanudo asks, it, oh, he bought a per property originally on, sold on June this year for 74K. Did you, oh no, he's talking about this one, I think. Miguel Angel asks, it, it was originally sold on June this year for 74K. Did you put almost 100K in renovations in? No, I hope not. <laughs> you got to leave some room for profit in there for JWB. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that's happened a few times, which I found out in our monthly sales cards meetings, which is, which is never fun. Um, but I mean, it, it highlights a good point. I mean, JWB takes on all of the risk when it comes to a uh, property renovation. In fact, I shared a story, I don't know, maybe three, four months ago where JWB went and bought a property and there was a problem with the title search. And uh, we bought that property for $100,000 just the property. Then we needed to renovate it. Then we were going to sell it. And uh, there was a problem with it. And we were left holding the bag. JWB literally lost $100,000 by buying that property. And that one hurt. Um, you know, if the renovation goes over and we renovate it and we spend twice as much as we expected to, the property still is sold to you at market value. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of risk when you're doing that 450 times a year. And we assume all of that. And so, um, so, so I hope we didn't do a hundred grand of renovations there, Miguel. 
I, man, I love the I love the radical transparency, and that's kind of what this show is about, right? I mean, obviously, the 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 Profit Center for JWB is in that spread of risk, right? You are looking for properties, you purchase them, you you know what they're going to sell at a market value, you renovate them. That's the spread that you make, and then at the end of the day, your property management company is it's not a loss leader, but it's not a big profit maker because you make money on the sale of more properties to your clients that love working with you year after year. And that's really no bones about it. That's the profit center of the business, right? 100% accurate. All right. Then we don't need to talk about that anymore. Checkmated it, bro. Checkmated it. Uh, Quick question from from Miguel Angel again. Is it possible for a non-US resident to get conventional financing in Florida? It's, it's, to the best of my knowledge, it's not possible. I mean, things are always changing. Um, Miguel, I I remember your name. So I don't know if you've spoken with my team yet about it, um, but uh, you definitely can't get conventional financing. There may be a financing option for you, um, but it's generally pretty difficult if you're not uh, in the country. Yeah. And, and Margaret Smith has a follow-up question here. By the way, uh, if you want to talk to the team, right, if these are specific questions, go to chatwithjwb.com. Greg, before we wrap up here, there's a couple more questions I want to get into. Are you okay going a couple minutes over? You're, yeah, you're all right there, buddy? All right, mm-hmm. cool. Good, because Margaret Smith has a couple questions that I want to hit, but real quick. Wait, was uh, Margaret the, the one who gave us that amazing comment for the last show with the, uh, with the case study? That's right. Margaret had her mind blown. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret said, damn, That's when right. we were talking about <laughs> the, uh, the difference between cash and financing. And Margaret, I don't know if we said thank you for that, but Pablo and I have been so fired up about your comment and uh, your excitement that uh, we, we, we appreciate you being here. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. And Margaret, right now you're only chatting to us. So if you want to change it so everybody else sees your questions, you got to hit that drop down that drop down button and put all panelists and attendees. But yes, thank you for reminding me of that because that was absolutely a highlight of my week. That was it excellent. Was. And she, you know, she's asking market values determined by bank appraisal, presumably. I mean, I, I would assume that it's, it's that plus just conditions, right? Like it's, it's what people will pay, right? Well, yes, market well, value is always what somebody is willing to pay for anything. Uh, but the reality with real estate is that in order for the transaction to work, the bank has to lend for conventional financing. So you're going to get an appraisal and that appraisal needs to match the sales price. So properties are sold at market value. The appraisal gets done and that matches the sales price. And then the lender is satisfied to lend on it and all that good stuff. So Yes, an appraisal. And that's included in those closing costs that we, um, you know, that two and a half percent of the purchase price, that's in one of the costs that's included there. All right. Speaking of mind blowing comments, we got Denise in the chat saying, I just put three homes under contract with JWB, all rented. Woo, woo. All right, Denise, way to go. That's incredible. Congratulations. D- Denise, where are you from? Let us know. Let us know. All right. And speaking of where you're from, Marilyn Cotterman from Homosassa, Florida, home of the manatees. <laughs> oh, you, I, sh- I just you, took away I that. thought you were teeing me up, man. I just checkmated it for you, man. Gosh. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> she asks, who handles the closings for JWB? What company? So, uh, in fact, if you were here in the studio, uh, we, the, the title company, the attorney's office is literally, I could throw a rock and hit them right across the parking lot. So, um, in JWB's office complex, we actually own another building that we lease to the McKillop Law Firm, who for all of our current clients, and I don't know if Denise is through that process yet, but um, she'll get to know the McKillop Law Firm. Uh, they're an incredible partner for us and uh, make it very smooth and easy for everybody to close. And so that's what, who would be handling your closing. Awesome. And Denise is from Freedom Township, New Jersey. All right. New Jersey. Thank you so much for your trust. Yeah. So Muhammad has a follow-up and he says, if I come up with 20% down payment, still your answer is no. I'm assuming that that is for the um, term that I still don't remember what it was. Yes. Subject to the existing mortgage. Unfortunately, Muhammad, yes. The answer is still no. So there's not a a current mortgage that you would be able to assume, uh, nor would you want to because JWB pays a really high interest rate to borrow the money before you see it. It's a whole nother segment. Um, along the line. So a uh, simple answer to you is uh, unfortunately no, but it sounds like you have some of the capital. You just need to figure out the financing part of it. Mohammed, I would really encourage you to talk to my team. There might be something that we can come up with creatively uh, to help you get where you need to go. 
So Dominic Albano asks, uh, Albano, Albano, I hope I, I pronounced that correctly, Dominic. Sorry, I may have missed this. 25% or 20% down for this cash flow. Should I go to that second sheet here, Greg? Yeah, that- you can do that. We'll go to the, the, the numbers heavy sheet, which totally freaks people out the Look first time. Thing, see. Huh? <laughs> yeah. So this tab is where all of your cash flows and your year over year appreciation is there. Um, an earlier question was, um, you know, the, the rent growth, what do you see? Well, that 1% figure in row 12 there, that's the rent growth there. So, but as we're focusing in now, you see your financing assumptions. Again, for everybody who wants this to mess around with yourself and change this from 25% down to 20% down or whatever your heart desires, this is the investor toolkit or this is a part of the investor toolkit. And so you can do this. And I would highly encourage you to use this to evaluate JWB properties, which is going to be done for you, of course, but use this to evaluate and compare apples, apples to other uh, properties out there in other markets as well. Um, so yeah, so you can change that from 25 to 20%. And what that does is if you put less down, Pablo, what's that going to do to the return on investment? You- it's going to increase the return on investment, right? There you go. There you go. When you put less money down, you're going to increase your overall return uh, because you put less down. Appreciation, uh, again, goes up the same rate as well as cash flow goes up. So for our friend listening on the podcast, we put down the 20% and it went from that 10.4% return on investment without appreciation to 11.81. And if you also put in the historical appreciation, it went up to 30.92 up from like 28%, something like that, right? Exact mundo. So that is exact mundo right there. Um, you know, Margaret had a question. I, I guess we can answer Peter's question real quick and then we'll go to, to Margaret's question that she had in the chat. I just don't want to lose track of it. Peter asks, if appraisal is much larger than purchase price, can I take advantage of that at closing time? I wish you could. I wish you could. Uh, you know, the reality is that an appraisal is there to justify the sales price uh, when it comes to uh, an appraisal for a, a purchase and sale contract. Um, and so regardless if the appraised value on that appraisal is higher than the sales price, then it's not going to change the sales price for it. It's not going to be to your benefit other than it just makes you feel good, which happens sometimes. And if the appraisal is lower, right, the sales price is not going to drop, right? So either way, the sales price is the same, which hopefully is good, right? You bought it based on the certain numbers and then those numbers, you know, see themselves to fruition either way. All right. And then last question today is a question that used to be really prevalent in this, uh, in, this, in, in this call. And now we're hearing much less. But Margaret Smith asks, how are you doing with COVID now? Have you had to do any evictions? Do you have tenants in homes who are not paying rent? Um, what, you know, what is the rental collection numbers, right? We used to be really heavy on rental collection mm-hmm. numbers and how that's all working. And that's kind of fallen by the wayside because we keep hammering how well it's going. But I think mm-hmm. Margaret's a little bit newer to the audience. So maybe talk a little yeah. bit about that. It's, it's great. I mean, we're all still dealing with the pandemic and uh, it's good to talk about it, right? So um, from a rent collection perspective, been really happy with how uh, we've been able to perform. I think it's an incredible credit to our property management team and the leadership there. You all got to meet Melissa Gillespie, who runs our property management team a few weeks ago, and she's an incredible leader. And, um, and if you look at the numbers, we've been over 97% of rents collected for the last five months consistently since COVID started. So over 97% of rent collection is incredible. Um, Leasing is on fire. Leasing is on fire. Would you believe that we're going to drive in, we're on pace to drive in over 52,000 new leads from people that want to rent our homes just this year. I'm putting the business plan together for next year. I have to drive in 60,000 leads of people who want to rent our homes, over a thousand a week are currently sending in information wanting to rent one of your homes out there. Um, And that is setting the table for our leasing team to do an incredible job. And I want to talk about a team that has overcome and been nimble and flexible, right? We were sort of built to handle the the COVID changes and going remote and all that. We we had done self-guided showings for residents out there for years now. So we 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 were built for it. But at the same time, our leasing team has done an incredible job right? Being able to navigate and to be able to rent homes in an environment like we've had with such uncertainty with everybody in normal life is, um, is really challenging. And they've set records. We're going to rent almost 1,300 homes this year. Um, and in, a, in an environment where there's not much consistency in the world 
over the last five months, they've been a consistent overachieving uh, teammate. So, or a group of teammates. So super excited on the leasing side, rent collection has been incredibly strong. And uh, the other elements renewals and our, our residents are continuing to renew. So the stats are all really great. I do want to shed some light on some, some challenges. I mean, I can't deny the fact that there are people in our homes who are not paying rent that we cannot evict still currently um, slowly, but surely the, the ability to evict is, is, is taking baby steps. We're in the middle of kind of our first baby step, which is filing some evictions on, on those when it's just really necessary and seeing how the courts are going to handle that. Uh, technically, it's the burden of the resident to prove that they've been affected by COVID financially, and that's why they can't pay the rent. Um, so there are some residents that are, are there and they're not paying rent. And that's just, that's just reality. But overall, uh, incredibly positive and, and really much better than my expectations coming into COVID. Uh, and I had pretty high expectations. So I want to clarify a couple points there. One is something we didn't hit in this question. I don't know if I even asked it, but she also asked who does the evictions if needed? Oh, we have an attorney that we have a relationship with actually a couple of attorneys that we have relationships with that would handle the eviction for you. Let's call it about $500 for an expense to you when it comes to an eviction. And generally in a normal time, it takes about 45 days to evict from the start of the eviction to the time that the sheriff removes them from the home and we handle everything for you. Awesome. And then the last thing I want to clarify there is because we went over this in a past call is the idea that that 3% uh, that isn't paying rent. Those are people that moved in before COVID whose life have affected. If you're buying a new property right now, you are buying a property that's being rented by somebody that has qualified under current conditions that is going to sign a two to three year lease. Correct. So therefore it's almost like a diversification of risk to buy another property, right? Like this is a very real issue for somebody that has been owning a property there for a while. Mm -hmm. um, but for a new investor, it's a different way to think about it, right? Yeah. If you had to think about the riskiest time to buy a property in terms of potentially seeing an, uh, a high vacancy cost, right? It would have been right before COVID broke. Yeah. Would have been like January, February, right? Yeah. That would have been the riskiest time. And oh, by the way, those people are still seeing 97% as a part of the, the greater, the greater, the greater um, rent collection here, um, 90, over 97% rent collected. So that would have been the riskiest time because you had literally, I mean, how many um, unemployment filings did we have in March and April, right? As, a, as an economy, right? It was 10 million a week for a while there, right? Now the numbers, whatever it is, hundreds of thousands or much less than what it was. So and then all of your people, the person who buys this property on Checkmate, right? Your resident will be qualified under the standards for today, which means that the chances of them losing their job to COVID is much less than what it was prior. And the standards are always really strict. So the, the risk of the COVID effect to you today is less than what it was in call it January, February, or March. Um, and even when it was January, February, or March, this asset class has performed so much better than other asset classes, which have been incredibly variable, like the stock market, like oil prices. Uh, that's why you came to rental property investing. There you go. You know, Mohammed Uden puts in the, in the Q&A box. Thank you so much, Greg and Pablo. I greatly appreciate the Q&A transparent of Greg, and I learned a lot of great info. I, I agree, Greg. I, you know, I like, uh, I like applauding you for the way that you answer the questions that most people would be like, uh, yeah, maybe he's, uh, you know, you just kind of tackle it straight on, man. I, you know, I, I think it's really, really refreshing. And we got the only way to be. All right. Cool. I agree. I agree. Two more questions. Marilyn asks, are from Homosasa, Florida. Home of the manatees. <laughs> there, there you go. She asks, are you seeing more three-year leases during COVID right now? You know, it hasn't been something that's been brought up to me. I would imagine it's about the same. I mean, our average lease term usually is about, call it 27 to 30 months. Um, and I would imagine that's where we are right now. And that's the initial lease term. The average stay of a resident is 54 months. So we renew residents and they stay. But yeah, our initial lease, lease term is somewhere between two and three years. And I would imagine it's been about the same. Great. And Peter has a follow-up question. That is, my appraisal question is from lender point of view. Can I get a, t a loan at 20% of appraisal instead of purchase price? Thanks again. 
Can you get a loan for 20% of appraisal? No. So I think you're asking, will you be able to kind of structure your potential loan with the lender going in and saying, instead of you lending 20% of the purchase price of the home, will you lend 20% of the appraisal amount? No lender is going to do that. So I, I wouldn't really spend too much time doing that, trying okay. to make that happen. There you go. Greg, we still have We've done, we've done an hour and 11 minutes today. This might be this, our longest call. And we still got a whole bunch of people here. Thank you all for being here. This is, this is incredible. It's been incredible, man. And this has been, I, I would say that this has been in a week, the longest we've spent with people, with the most amount of people, right? Like we had like 50 plus something people on Tuesday that stayed with us an extra like 10, 15 minutes. Today we have, you know, we, at, at its peak, we're like in the mid forties. Um, over 32 people still with us, man. Like the idea that during the middle of the week, you can take two and a half hours and hang out with us. It just blows my mind. And it's really, really feels good of, of, of the value that we must perceivedly be putting out there. And so I just really want to thank everybody that's here um, and the great questions that you ask and how easy you make it for me to ask these questions by, you know, like just teeing it up to Greg over here so he can checkmate it. Um, but you know, it's, it's just been a great experience. I just want to encourage anybody that is, um, hey, you know what? One more question, Greg, you ready? Sean okay. asks with such long leases, is there a percentage added year after year to keep up with current rents? Yes. Yes, there is. So I'll kind of take it from the other perspective. All right. Some people may say, Oh, long-term leases are no good. Cause you get capped at the, the rent today and you get no rent appreciation for three years. And that's, that's baloney. <laughs> um, you can get rent escalators while you sign long-term leases, which is what we do. So for a resident who only signs up for a two-year lease, they have a $50 rent escalation in the second year. For a resident who signs up for a three-year lease, we keep the rent consistent for the first two years and we get that $50 rent escalator in the third year. So that's how you do it. Check mate. Game set. <laughs> All right. I've already thanked everybody. I'm going to leave you with two things. One is go get that free investor toolkit. Go to, go to jwbwebclass.com investor toolkit. I don't think I said that correctly there. Pick up this spreadsheet. It's a lot of fun to play with, right? I like messing around with it um, and, and listen to Greg doing his thing. It, it's, it's more time with Greg. I have found is good for me in my life. And the other thing is next week we have Jen Filzen coming back, right? And yes. we, so Jen, this is a question that I have myself, right? Cause I'm renting and I'm not really ready to buy the, the property that I want to live in. So I ask myself, is it a good idea to invest in rental properties before I have my own residence mortgage? And the more I read in Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which I'm halfway through right now, the more a better idea it, see, it sounds like. But Jenna has actually done this. She lives in Monterey, California. It's a prohibitively expensive market. And she has grown this portfolio of asset of assets that are income producing for her because she took this strategy. So it's gonna be a really, really informative call. I invite you all to join the Facebook group, join us next Tuesday. You're gonna get the reminders, you're already registered in. Um, and without further ado, I'll tee it up for you, Greg, to say goodbye to our friends here. As always, it's just a pleasure to be here with you all. You make this show more and more fun every single week. I, I do have to admit, you're making Pablo's job easier and easier, which makes me less less happy. I want to pile it on, so I'm probably going to try and quiz him and stump him more and more since you guys just tee up such great questions. You guys got to understand, when we were kicking this idea off to do this show, like whenever, six months ago or a year ago, together we're like, is anybody going to ever ask a question? <laughs> we, we both were like, okay, we'll make sure that we have questions prepared and we can, we can go. So it's, uh, it's incredible to see the, the engagement that you all have. I hope you're enjoying it. I hope you're having fun. Pablo and I are, and uh, we're going to keep, uh, we're going to keep coming back and doing the same thing. So thank you again. And um, you will definitely want to show up for the show on Tuesday at 1230 with Jen and Renee. They're incredible. And then another shout out, Pablo launched our podcast what was it, maybe three months ago, four months ago? Yeah, how about that? We'll love for you all to download the podcast. We just had our, what, 25th episode. We had over, how many, what was the threshold that we reached as far as downloads? We're getting 100 downloads a week, man. That's the threshold. downloads a week, yeah. yeah. It's a great way, and we're putting the property of the week on the, on the podcast as well. So if you want to listen to this and you're on the go, you're taking a run, whatever you're doing, go to, uh, go to where, do, where do they go? Where do they find it? Uh, whatever podcast platform you have, if you have a, if you have an iPhone, right? We don't, we're not iPhone elitists, but you can go to iTunes. If you don't have an iPhone, you can do it at Spotify. 
There's a Stitcher app that I used to use back before I got an iPhone that is also really, really good. There's multiple, multiple apps. We're on all the platforms. So anywhere you go, just check out Not Your Average Investor Show. Or if you look, if you put in Greg's name or my name, that show is going to come up as well. So that'll help too. There you go. All right, everybody. Have a great rest of the week. We'll catch you on Tuesday. Catch you on Tuesday. Mahalo to you, Zach. Adios to you, uh, Miguel Angel. Goodbye, everybody. See you on Tuesday. Take care.